of the puzzle. For the present, it is the nature of the puzzle itself that I want to make clear. On the face of it, the Michelson-Morley experiment showed that, relative to the Earth, the velocity of light is always the same in all directions. If a light signal is sent out from a body, that body will remain at the centre of the waves as they travel outwards, no matter how it may be moving. At least, that will be the view of observers moving with the body. This was the plain and natural meaning of the experiments, and Einstein succeeded in inventing a theory which accepted it. But at first it was thought logically impossible to accept this plain and natural meaning. An analogy will make it clear how very odd the facts are. If you are on an escalator, you reach the top sooner if you walk up than if you stand still. But if the escalator moved with the velocity of light, you would reach the top at exactly the same moment whether you walked up or stood still. If you were walking along a road at the rate of six kilometres an hour and a car passes you going in the same direction at the rate of 40 kilometres an hour, then if you and the car both keep going, the distance between you after an hour will be 34 kilometres. But if the car met you going in the opposite direction, the distance after an hour will be 46 kilometres. Now, if the car were travelling with the velocity of light, it would make no difference whether it met or passed you. In either case, it would, after a second, be 300,000 kilometres from you. And it would also be 300,000 kilometres from any other car which happened to be passing or meeting you less rapidly at the previous second. This seems impossible. How can the car be at the same distance from a number of different points along the road. Think of a fly touching the surface of a stagnant pool. It causes ripples, which move out in widening circles. The centre of the circle, at any moment, is the point of the pool touched by the fly. If the fly moves about over the surface of the pool, it does not remain at the centre of the ripples. But if the ripples were waves of light, and the fly, a physicist, it would find that it always remained at the centre of the ripples. Meanwhile, a physicist sitting beside the pool would judge, as in the case of ordinary ripples, that the centre was not the fly, but the point of the pool touched by the fly. If another fly had touched the water at the same moment, it also would find that it remained at the centre of the ripples, even if it separated itself widely from the first fly. This is analogous to the Michelson-Morley experiment. The pool corresponds to the ether, the fly to the earth. The contact of the fly in the pool to the light signal which Michelson and Morley sent out. The ripples correspond to the light waves. Such a state of affairs seems, at first sight, quite impossible. Take the example of the pedestrian and the car. Suppose there are a number of people at the same point of the road, some walking, some in cars. Suppose they are going at varying rates, some in one direction and some in another. If, at a moment, a light flash is sent out from the place where they all are, by each traveller's watch, the light waves will be 300,000 kilometres from each of them after a second, although the travellers will no longer be all in the same place. At the end of a second, by your watch, it will be 300,000 kilometres from you, and it will also be 300,000 kilometres from any of the people who met you when it was sent out, after a second by their watches, even if they were moving in the opposite direction, assuming both to be perfect watches. There is only one way of explaining such facts. Watches and clocks must be affected by motion. I do not mean that they could be constructed more accurately. I mean that if you say an hour has elapsed between two events, judged by ideally careful measurements made with ideally accurate chronometers, another equally precise person who has been moving rapidly relatively to you may judge that the time was more or less than an hour, and you cannot say that one is right and the other wrong. Until the advent of the special theory of relativity, no one had thought that there could be any ambiguity in the statement that two events in different places happened at the same time. 
It might be that if the places were very far apart, it could be difficult to determine for certain whether the events were simultaneous. But everyone thought the meaning of the question perfectly definite. But this was a mistake. Two events in distant places may appear simultaneous to one careful observer who has allowed for the velocity of light, while another, equally careful observer, may judge that the first event preceded the second, and still another may judge that the second preceded the first. This would happen if the three observers were all moving rapidly, relatively, to each other. They would all be equally right. The time order of events is in part dependent upon the observer. It is not always and altogether an intrinsic relation between the events themselves. Relativity theory shows not only that this view accounts for the phenomena, but also that it is the one which ought to have resulted from careful reasoning based upon the old data. In actual fact, however, no one noticed the logical basis of the theory of relativity until the odd results of experiment had given a jog to people's reasoning powers. How should we naturally decide whether two events in different places were simultaneous? Some would naturally say... They are simultaneous if they are seen simultaneously by a person who is exactly halfway between them. Suppose two flashes of lightning fall in two different places, say Greenwich Observatory and Kew Observatory. Suppose that St. Paul's is halfway between them, and that the flashes appear simultaneous to an observer on the dome of St. Paul's. In that case, a person at Kew will see the Kew flash first, and a person at Greenwich will see the Greenwich flash first because of the time taken by light to travel over the intervening distance. But all three, if they are ideally accurate observers, will judge that the two flashes were simultaneous, because they will make the necessary allowance for the time of transmission of the light. I am assuming a degree of accuracy far beyond human powers. Thus, so far as observers on the Earth are concerned, the definition of simultaneity will work well enough, so long as we are dealing with events on the surface of the earth. But our definition is no longer so satisfactory when we have two sets of observers in rapid motion relatively to each other. Suppose we see what would happen if we substitute sound for light and define two occurrences as simultaneous when they are heard simultaneously by someone halfway between them. This alters nothing in the principle, but makes the matter easier to understand owing to the much slower velocity of sound. Let us suppose that two brigands shoot the guard and engine driver of a train. The guard is at the back of the train. The brigands are on the line side and shoot their victims at close quarters. A passenger, who is exactly in the middle of the train, hears the two shots simultaneously. You would say, therefore, that the two shots were simultaneous. But a station master, who is exactly halfway between the two brigands at the line side, hears the shot which kills the guard first. The train travels away from the shot at the guard and towards the shot at the engine driver. Therefore, the noise of the shot at the guard has farther to go before reaching the passenger than the shot at the engine driver has. Therefore, if the passenger is right in saying that she heard the two reports simultaneously, the station master, not moving with the train, must be right in saying that he heard the shot at the guard first. We who live on the earth would naturally, in such a case, prefer the view of simultaneity obtained from a person travelling in a train. But in theoretical physics, no such parochial prejudices are permissible. A physicist on a comet, if there were one, would have just as good a right